Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I know what you're thinking. Ipernik, didn't you say that the last video was going to be the last of this series that clearly died in popularity and no one watches anymore? Yeah, that's true. That's what I said. Yet I realized that I had forgotten to talk about Terras, which was definitely not intentional. So, a lot of people have been asking me why I was so harsh on Terras and uh, what did it do to deserve my neglect? Well, back when I made the Syracuse video, I quickly went through the histories of the, the four civilizations I proposed in the poll, and Taras was the least interesting for me, as it really reminded me of Syracuse, and I did not want to give Greeks a second episode in a series which didn't really wasn't wasn't really about them. However, after I had my second look. I realized that Terra's impact was very substantial, arguably to the same amount uh, as Syracuse. So let's put the bad thoughts aside and let's get right into the good history. So the city of Terra's was founded in the late uh, 700s BC and it sits right here south of Apulia. What seems to be the first thing you see is the weird shape and how effective it can be in terms of defense. Right in between the sea and the lagoon lays the acropolis of the city with all the government buildings and religious structures, as well as where the military is stationed. On the left it's where most people lived uh, and the necropolis, the place where the dead were buried. Usually necropolises are like amusement parks for archaeologists, in fact there are several city stations where the digging is done. Now that we more or less know how ancient Terras was uh, organized, let's talk about its inhabitants. The Greeks who founded Terras were related to the ones from uh, Sparta, and as we will later see, they kept their bonds with Spartan culture to a so substantial extent. The Terrasians loved Poseidon or Neptune if you are a Rome fanboy. Their biggest temple was dedicated to the god of the sea himself. Taras also had a giant statue of Zeus, uh, which was very big, yet no one talks about it because it was beaten by the Colossus of Rhodes in terms of height. Another great structure was the amphitheater that faced the ocean, but that last part is important, you will find out later why. Their most important celebration was the early festival Dionysius, uh, the god of wine and parties. I don't think I need to explain what the celebration was about. Taras was not that big of a threat for the first 200 years of its history. They were in fact constantly under the threat of native Apulians, uh, such as the Poecetsi and the Mesapians. Check out the Mesapians video for more about them. The reason why they were so weak was because they didn't have a democracy and usually wouldn't be that much of a problem other than the fact that their monarchy was extremely messy and had a hard time to stay in power. Eventually, after losing against the natives in 500 BC, uh, circa, the monarch was dethroned and the democracy was established. During this time, the Spartan ways of Tarento started to float back up as their passive foreign policy was completely renewed in favor of a more expansionistic uh, one at the expense of the Poetrezzi and the Messapians. Initially they were the only ones getting wrecked until 444 BC when a dispute came up with another great colony in Calabria called Turi. The dispute was a territorial one over the control of the area of Heraclea which would be today's Basilicata. In 444 BC, the two fought without reaching a proper agreement, and 11 years later they fought again, with another statement, stalemate, but this time decided to share the region. Terras was not done though, during the Peloponnesian War they sided with Sparta and sent supplies. The Spartans paid, off, uh, paid back the favor in 343 BC, when they went at war with, with the Messapians together with, the, with Terras, which they lost 5 years later and the Spartan king was killed. Don't be alarmed though, Taras was still pretty powerful, so powerful that Rome got involved in 303 BC when the Lucanians, a tribe in Calabria, asked them to intervene in the conflict in between them, because they were losing pretty badly. Rome however didn't 
feel very confident about this, so he accepted the alliance, but only to negotiate peace with Taras. One of the conditions was uh, from Taras was that Rome was not allowed to enter their sea territory, which uh, meant they could not cross this spot with their ships. This wimpy attitude from Rome wouldn't last long, as in 282 BC, the city of Turi asked Rome for assistance for a siege by the Lucani, who had surrounded their capital. Rome sent 10 ships to help, however they had to go into Terrace's territory in order to reach the city, and so they did. After successfully taking down the Lucanians, the 10 ships went to Terrace. Why you ask? I could not found, find out why, but I guess it was to resupply or something. You already know one of the reasons why it was a bad idea, but here's the second reason. The day the Roman ships arrived in Tar Taranto, um, I mean Taras, was during the festival of Dionysius, and all the people were at the amphitheater having a good time, and since they faced the sea, they could clearly see the Roman ships approaching. The Romans were not very liked by Taras, so the mood was quickly ruined, and Taras sent their own fleet to deal with the Romans. The Romans lost, of course, and while in any other context the Romans would have, would have declared war after such an insult, the Romans decided to send an ambassador to, to deal with the issue. The men chose to negotiate the lives of the prisoners captured and the ships taken was Lucius Postumius Megellus. Unfortunately, he was not greeted respectfully, he was made fun of for his clothes and his funny Greek. The last straw was reached when a politician sped on him. Postumius lost it and went back to Rome. Then the war between the two powers in Italy began in 281 BC. As you can imagine, Rome won this war in 272, even though Tyrus initially had the upper hand due to his ally, King of Epirus, Pyrrhus I. It lost anyway, and all of the treasures and great mines of Tyrus were taken and moved to Rome instead. Since then, Tyrus hasn't been the same. During the Second Punic War, it had a minor role when the city, now under Roman control, opened its gates to Hannibal, though it was punished three years after the conflict by having their people massacred. From then on, uh, no more insurrections came to be and the people who were left eventually got absorbed into Roman society. So guys, uh, we did it. We finally finished the series. I'm already thinking what to do next, but I was considering to talk about uh, more um, about history, of course, but you know, extend myself into other periods of time and, and not only to, you know, just concentrate and focus on um, ancient history and perhaps also go back to anthropology. Perhaps I will try have uh, even less of a schedule so that every time there is a new video, it's always a surprise. However, um, I will still keep um, some sort of continuity. Um, or maybe, why don't you give me some suggestions? I would really appreciate it, actually. Anyway, that's all I have. See you next time. Let me know what you would like.